Welcome to the congregation of Yahweh. We're here on Yahweh's Sabbath day. Greetings to those on the internet and those that might be watching live. We hope you enjoy the messages that go out. Uh, today's message, um, we're going to focus in on, on Brother Peter and, and Brother Paul. Um, I'm not, I can't speak for everybody else, but I had a pretty uh, a radical experience when I, when I came into the faith. And, you know, there had been several times in my life when I was, was not knowledgeable and I thought I was confessing a Savior, but there was no transformation. There was no change of heart. It was only, uh, you know, just doing what I thought I was supposed to do because I was forced to go to church a few times. Um, but within the past few weeks, maybe even a couple months, um, I've just really been inspired to focus in on the basics. And I, I think we have a weakness in this walk. And the weakness is getting a lot of knowledge and forgetting where we come from. And turning things into legalistic issues and making the same mistakes as uh, those Judaizers of, of Acts 15 and, and a few other places in the book of Galatians. You know, there were believers, people that believed in Yeshua the Messiah, that wanted new converts to do everything right before they could enter in. And in Acts chapter 15, um, when, you know, they had a, a meeting, the elders had to come together and, and discuss what was going on with the Gentiles coming into the faith. And it was decided that four things needed to be done immediately. Now, the way the mainstream interprets that today, some in the mainstream, is the Gentiles only have to do four things. Well, that's a very sorry interpretation. That's sorry. Uh, if that is truly the interpretation, that means you can do anything but those four things. So it's obvious that those things were very prevalent in the day and they were disgusting to Yahweh and to his people and they needed to stop doing those things immediately before they came into fellowship. And the conclusion was that, you know, let's get them to stop doing these things immediately and they will learn from Moses in the synagogues on the Sabbath day. That's uh, 1521, I believe. Let me just double check that. Yeah, 1521, uh, 20 and 21, the conclusion is stop doing those four things because Moses of old time and every city has him preached being read in the synagogues on the Sabbath day. Now, let's, let's kind of put that into perspective of us. Uh, we have, you know, Yahweh has just poured out a tremendous amount of, of understanding and knowledge on this congregation and there's there's a, a large movement of people that are coming into the faith they're learning that repent actually means turn back to the way not a, not a different way but turn back to the way from from whence you came or, or or the original way that you were supposed to be walking but let's kind of put this in perspective you know we who who have these truths when people who are less enlightened come in, it's very common. You can see it on, on social media. You can see it. Um, I've even, you know, uh, heard a little bit of contention, you know, uh, you know, throughout the years. Sometimes it just kind of made me cringe about the way things were coming across. And we have to remember that these new people coming in are exactly where we used to be. And uh, cramming an understanding down someone's throat or coming across the wrong way is not the grace that we're reading about here in Acts chapter 15. And Acts 15 is like, okay, you know, these four things, they got to stop this immediately, but let's give them some grace to grow. And the scripture says that Yahweh is going to finish the work in us that he started. Now, we as believers, we can plant seeds. We can water the seeds, but only Yahweh can give the increase, but we have to be very careful how we plant the seed. You can't take a, a seed and just shove it down somebody's throat and not, you, you know, you got to make sure the soil is right. 
you got to make sure the soil is healthy and it's actually going to play its part in the production of the seed. And you got to come back to the same place that the seed was planted and water it. You got to check on it and make sure it's going to grow. So, you know, we have to be uh, very gentle um, and, and understanding when we come across. But the weakness that I was talking about in this movement about being legalistic of things is there's a lot of things that have nothing to do with our entrance into the kingdom. And we split hairs about it, we divide over it, we cause contention about it. And I personally, I, I don't see anything wrong with a large body of people and some having differences of opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with somebody, you know, if somebody thinks that there's an extra letter in, in a word, or if somebody, you know, has a different opinion about, you know, when a date is supposed to be, you know, that's fine. Give them some grace to grow, but that's no reason to be uh, con contentious and, you know, because if there wasn't a lot of evidence in a certain direction, people wouldn't believe it. So obviously they have enough evidence to cause them to see something in a different light or a different opinion. Not necessarily mean it's right. You know, uh, for instance, you know, well, I'm not even going to get into it, but there's just so many, and the, as we progress in this, this movement, it's getting, in, in some circles, it's getting more and more divisive and contentious over things that have nothing to do with your entrance into the kingdom. And that's the reason I want to focus in on Peter and Paul today. When I think of, of disciples and apostles and, and men that followed Yeshua that made a major impact, the first two people that come to mind is Peter and Paul. So I want to go back and look at their blueprint and see what happened to them at their conversion. And, you know, I, I started this off saying that I had a, a radical transformation. And I, and I had, uh, you know, just the, the presence just came in, into my life in such a big way. And, and before we leave here, before we leave here, I want to, I want to say a special uh, prayer and I want to be in unity with everybody. If anybody hasn't had that experience, I want them to experience that today before they leave. But uh, let's start off in John chapter 17. This is a uh, prayer from Yeshua to his father. And let's see what Yeshua expected to happen from his believers and what he prayed would happen. In John 17 and verse 14, praying to the Father, Yeshua says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So he's expecting from his followers and praying to his Father that his followers would be separate from the world and that they would be sanctified or set apart by his truth, which was his word. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. That's an amazing statement. Yeshua sent his followers into the world in the same manner that Yeshua was sent into the world. And he was sent to give his life for other people, to take up his cross, and he tells us to, to take up the stake or the cross and follow him. And uh, that reminds me, uh, you know, the, the disciples were, were arguing over who would be the greatest. And he said, he that is servant will be greatest of all. And he calls us to be servants to our brothers. And to um, uh, John, I mean, excuse me, Romans chapter 12, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. We are called to be sacrifices for the cause of Yahweh. Um, verse 19. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, is he just talking about his disciples here and he's saying that uh, I pray uh, for these disciples and I also pray for those that would believe on me through their word. Well, if he's only talking about the disciples 
as soon as those disciples are, are gone, that word would be snuffed out. I believe he's talking about all of his believers that will be speaking and witnessing and testifying of him. And he's praying for those that believe on the continuation of that word. That they may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gave me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are. Let's look at the commission that he gave his uh, disciples in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. Now there's a phrase in these uh, verses here that is, is debated. And the reason it's debated is because it was not in most manuscripts. And some of the early ch church fathers that uh, commentated on these scriptures in many, 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 many references, this was not here. Uh, and that's where it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Which if you read the book of Acts, every single baptism throughout the entire book was done in the name of Yeshua. So uh, either they were bis being disobedient to this or there is something a little uh, funny going on with that particular phrase. But anyway, starting in verse 18, And Yeshua came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So his commission to his disciples was to go to all nations, baptizing them and teaching them everything that he taught. And we know that he did not have his own doctrine. He said, my doctrine is not my own, but his that sent me. The words that I speak are not mine. They're the Father's. I'm only saying what he is commanding me to speak. And he's the prophet of Deuteronomy chapter 18, where he always says, I'll put my word in his mouth. And anybody that doesn't listen to my word that's in his mouth will be cut off. So we know that the disciples are supposed to go out and teach Yahweh's word. In Luke chapter 24, Starting in verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And I'm going to point out, you know, he's, he's telling them that there's writings in Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning him and as we review the conversion of Peter and Paul uh, very frequently and all throughout the Messianic scriptures you will see them quoting the Tanakh, the Old Testament proving through the scriptures that he truly is the Messiah son of Yahweh uh, verse 45 then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them thus it is written and thus it behooved Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name amongst all nations. So uh, the last great commission was teach them everything that I taught you. Here it should be preached repentance and remission of sins amongst all nations starting at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So he gives them a commission and he says, wait in the city because I have a promise that's going to come upon you and you're going to be in, 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 endued with power from on high. I, I believe that word means to be clothed with the power from on high. In Luke 22, go back to chapter Luke 22 and verse 31. In 
Yeah, this is uh, while they're they're sitting down at the, the Passover meal, and they have uh, um, verse thirty one. He's talking to Peter, and the master said, "Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail thee not." And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. If you want an interesting Bible study, look up that word converted. Go through your scriptures and, and see uh, where all those are at. Very interesting word. And we're going to lead up to here where I, I believe there has been a conversion of Peter. Peter's conversion experience. And, and of course, we're going to discuss Paul's conversion so he says, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. That word converted actually means to turn somebody in the right direction. And uh, I'm paraphrasing the definition, but that's pretty much what it means. Strengthen is to, to take your brother and turn them in the right direction. And verse, oh, excuse me. Let's go to uh, John 21. So when Peter is converted, he's supposed to turn his brothers in the right direction. So, so far, you know, Peter has denied Yeshua three times. He has seen a resurrection. He has received a commission to go out and teach all nations. And what we find here in John chapter 21 is very surprising. After seeing all this, and after being told what he's supposed to do in John 21 and verse 3, Simon Peter says unto them, I'm going fishing. They say unto him, we also will go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Yeshua stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Yeshua. Now, I'm going to skip down just a little bit for the, the sake of time. I'm going to go to verse 15. So, you know, they, 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 he tells them where to put the net. They bring in tons of fish, and they said, that's the master. Peter jumps in and, and says he, he was uh, jumping in naked, which, anyway. Uh, he, he, he gets to shore. They get to shore, and Yeshua's already got fish waiting on him. Uh, in verse 15. So when they had dined, Yeshua saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Master, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep, or excuse me, feed my lambs. He saith to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith, Yea, Master, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Master, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Yeshua saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So I believe there's a reason he's building Peter up to something for a revelation. I think that Peter has been a little, little stubborn about the great commission, what he's supposed to be doing. And instead he's going fishing. And asking him three times was, was a reminder that he denied him three times. And it's also setting him up that when he has this vision in Acts chapter 10, three times, three men coming to see him, he's saying, Peter, the time is now. Take this message to the nations like I told you to. And men from the nations are coming to him because they have seen uh, or, or uh, Cornelius had a vision from an angel to go find Peter and, and get the words from him. So anyway, but he asked him, do you love me more than these? And he's talking about, do you love me more than these, these fish? And I think it was a message to him that you went fishing all night and didn't catch nothing. And I had it right here waiting on you. And, uh, Wait, yes. Did you ever notice that in that exchange, um, Messiah said, do you agape as the, the Greek word, different love word. He yeah. responded with Leo. Yeah, I have, I have noticed that. Yeah. Um. 
So, what does he mean, feed my sheep, feed my lambs? What does that mean? Let's look at Mark 6.46. He's asking... He's asking Peter to feed them. Uh, apparently, I wrote I wrote the wrong verse down, but I'll go ahead and say there's a place where he says that he looked upon the multitudes and they were as sheep having no shepherd. And it says that immediately he began to teach them. Also in uh, uh, John chapter 10, if you read there, you'll find out about uh, the sheep and the shepherd. And also Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, so when he's talking about feeding the sheep, he means lead the sheep to good pastures, pastures which is simply give them the word unchanged. And you'll find in Ezekiel 34 how the religious leaders of the day muddied and trampled the pastures so that the sheep couldn't get any uh, nourishment from the pastures. Oh, thank you. 634? Yeah. 634, yeah. And Yeshua, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep having not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Also, when the sheep don't have a shepherd teaching them Yahweh's word, commandments, uh, the um, punishment for not keeping the word is being scattered. And that was uh, several places in Deuteronomy. says when his people didn't keep the word, they would be scattered amongst the nations. Um, okay, Acts chapter 1. We're going to start getting into the conversion of these two men. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. That's where we left off back there in Luke. John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Master, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and unto Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So here we see that uh, there's a promise that is is going to come upon them and it's his power his spirit and it's going to cause them to be witnesses in jerusalem judea samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth fulfilling the great commission to take the witness of his uh death burial and resurrection and all the things that he taught them um, and let's pick up in acts chapter 2 and verse 1 and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were all with one accord in one place. I want to point out that many times in Scripture you'll see great things happening when all his people come together. And uh, numerous writings from the rabbis said that uh, Yahweh's Spirit moved on Israel collectively as a body. And I know that's not what they teach in the mainstream. I've actually heard them say, well, well, before the Messiah came, only one or two people had the Spirit every once in a while. And then after Pentecost, that's when it was available to everybody. But that's not what they believed anciently. They believed that, that the Spirit indwelt His people collectively and that there were actually times of darkness when they, when they didn't have the Spirit collectively. Um, but anyway, and they were all with one accord in one place. And and that makes sense, you know, that we are His body. You know, we're a, a, a physical representation of Him on earth. Well, His body has a spirit. His body has a head. Um, anyway, I won't get into all that today, but verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat upon each of them. And they were all 
filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We'll skip down to verse 14. Now, after this display of the Spirit had taken place as they were gathered together, Peter stands up, and I believe that this is, is the beginning of, of what he told him to do. Numerous places you're going to see these men stand up with the Spirit and with power, preaching the message of Yeshua and using the Scriptures to do it. And I believe that this is a, is a perfect blueprint for us today to get back to the basics of what these men were going around preaching. Uh, verse 14. Chapter 2, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, said Yahweh, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of Yahweh come. And it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. Now, there's some translations out there that omit, <coughs> omit, you know, his name. And I think that because of the different translations, uh, this particular verse will be confusing as to what it says. A lot of people think that this verse is saying whosoever calls on the name of J-E-S-U-S. That's who they think this is talking about. But he's actually quoting from the Old Testament, the Tanakh, and that verse, if you go back to Joel, it says, Whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. And I, and this is my opinion, and there's numerous other verses. We're going to touch on another one over here. This is not saying, you know, whoever pronounces the name correctly shall be saved. This is saying whoever calls on the Creator and puts their trust. Uh, so anyway, we're going, to, we're going to visit another verse like that here in just a few minutes. Verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Yeshua of Nazareth, a man approved of Elohim among you by miracles and wonders and signs which Elohim did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of Elohim, you have taken and by wicked hands have impaled and slain, whom Yahweh has raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaks concerning him. I foresaw Yahweh always before my face, and he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also in my flesh shall I rest in hope. Again, Peter is using the scriptures to tell the people of his day what they're witnessing and what is going on. What you're seeing right now is a fulfillment of these verses. Uh, because thou wilt not leave my soul in the grave, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that Elohim has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Messiah to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Messiah, that his soul would not be left in the grave, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Yeshua hath Yahweh raised up, wherefore we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of Elohim exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth, forth this which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into heaven, but he saith himself, Yahweh said unto my master, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly 
the Elohim hath made the same Yeshua whom you had appealed, both Master and Messiah. Message number one. Yeshua is the Master and the Messiah. Message number two. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the brethren, What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yeshua Messiah, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, that should be our message to the mainstream church. That should be our message to the religious world and those who are lost out there. Yeshua is the Messiah. He is the Master, and we need to repent, which means turn to the way, turn to the Father's Word for the remission of sins, and be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the set apart spirit. That's the basics. And if you go, I'm not going to go there now, but if you go to uh, Hebrews chapter 5, it tells you what the basics are. It says the milk is repentance and faith. Before we go anywhere into strong doctrine or meat or divisive issues or things that will never get you into the kingdom, let's make sure we got the milk right. Repentance. Message number one. And it's only through Yeshua the Messiah that you can receive the forgiveness of sins. And he is the son of Yahweh. Uh, in verse 16, Thirty-nine. For the promise is unto you. He's talking to Israel here. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as Yahweh or Elohim shall call. And that's confirmation. When he says all that are afar off, that's why he said go to every nation, every creature, starting in Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the earth, teaching them everything I taught, which is Yahweh's word, and baptizing them so that they might receive the gift of the Spirit. And ladies and gentlemen, if we get that message down right and the Spirit is poured out into their life because they have a hunger, Yahweh will do the rest. He will draw them. That hunger that He gives a person, when they taste of that Spirit for the first time, that will give them a hunger and a thirst to know Yahweh more. And it doesn't take uh, uh, somebody that's enlightened trying to cram it down their throat for them to get it. If they have a hunger to get it, they're going to get it. And if they're out just to prove you wrong or they're out just to, you know, well, actually, sometimes when they try to prove you wrong, uh, they can't. They, 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 ended up, they end up coming to the truth. But there's some people that just don't want to learn and that's when the verse of Matthew 7 comes into play. Do not cast your pearls before swine, neither give that which is holy to the dogs. If they're going to trample on your truth, don't wait your time. But you got to use wisdom as to you know when that time is right. Let's go to, uh, well, I'll, I'll finish up there. Verse 40, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Untoward means crooked. Save yourself from this crooked generation. How do you do that? Receive Yeshua the Messiah. Repent. Be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then they that gladly received his word, the word that he just said, those four things, were baptized and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Interesting that that's the same number that was lost at Mount Sinai, which happened the same day in antiquity. In uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 11, we're picking up here uh, a man, a lame man, has just been healed. And in verse 11, As the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch, that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel ye at this, or why look you so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The Elohim of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the Elohim of our fathers, hath glorified his son Yeshua, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer 
to be granted unto you, and killed the prince of life, whom Elohim hath raised from the dead, whereof we are his witnesses. He's testifying of the resurrected Yeshua. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which Elohim before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Messiah should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Here's the message. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of Yahweh. And he shall send Yeshua Messiah, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which Elohim hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And just a little side note, this verse, verse 21 here, goes really well with what's going to happen at the end. It ties in with the uh, the rapture theory. A lot of people think that he's coming here and uh, uh, he's taking everybody to, to planet heaven or whatever. This verse says that heaven is going to hold him until the times of refreshing. Yes, the kingdom is coming here just like the prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 22 for Moses truly said unto you, the fathers, excuse me, unto the fathers, a prophet shall Yahweh your Elohim raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you, using the scriptures to tell them what is going on here. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from amongst the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. You are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which Elohim made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, Elohim, having raised up his son Yeshua, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. There's that, that first message. Turning from iniquities. Turning from sin. That is repentance. And the message of repentance has always been the same all the way back to Cain and Abel. He told Cain to turn from his sin. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was telling people to turn. All of the prophets, repent. John the Baptist, repent. The Messiah, repent. All the disciples repent, and it all meant the same thing. Turn back to obeying the words of the Most High. But today, out there in the mainstream, that's not their definition of repent. They got something different going on out there. Um, Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Uh, they had, had came before the Sanhedrin. And in verse 23, they were being let go, and they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to Elohim with one accord and said, Yahweh thou art Elohim, which hath made heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Uh, let me, just for the sake of time, let me skip down. Let's go, let's get into the conversion of, of Paul here. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. But it, uh, if you go back and read these, you know, Peter and the disciples and the, the message of Stephen, it's all the same. And especially, you know, Stephen goes back and tells us a whole history of Israel right before he gets stoned. And he tells the whole history of Israel how it led up to the Messiah. And ladies and gentlemen, when I say let's get back to the basics, we should be able to go back into the scriptures and show, and they're giving us a perfect example right here. Tell these people how he is the Messiah and his message is repent, believe the gospel, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, be baptized, and this milk, that's the basics that people need to get into the kingdom. Uh, 9, chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Master, 
went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, uh, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Very interesting that, that he's going to the synagogues to find people <coughs> that called on the name of Yeshua. It say they were going into these new churches over here. No, these were people that were in the synagogues that were calling on the name of Yeshua. And as he journeyed, he came to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Master? And the Master said, I am Yeshua, whom thou persecute. It is hard for thee to, prick against, to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Master, what will I have me do? Ladies and gentlemen, when we come into the presence of the Most High, when we have a conversion experience, that should be our first question. And if we don't hear his voice, we should find out what it says in Scripture. Father, what do you want me to do? And so far, we've read we need to be separate from the world. Uh, we need to, to teach everything he taught. We need to tell people to repent. We need to uh, tell people to be baptized for the remission of sins and receive the Holy Spirit. That's what we've read so far. Um, so, after he says, what do you want me to do? He says, go find this guy, Ananias. He's going to pray for you. And uh, let's pick up in verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Master, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the master said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before, king, for, before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, and I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Uh, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the master, even Yeshua, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou came, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight. Forthwith he arose and was baptized. And when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Messiah in the synagogues. Isn't that amazing? Just a few verses ago, he's on his way to bind people and, and drag them to prison. Desiring permission to do this. And just a few verses later, he received the Spirit, he's baptized, and immediately he's preaching Yeshua in the synagogue. And I guarantee you, what he's preaching is the resurrection. He is the Messiah. Um, everything that we've covered so far. And actually, if you follow this story, I went through and I looked at every message of Paul after this conversion, and that's exactly what his message was. Yeshua is the Son of Yahweh. He is the Messiah. There was a resurrection. Justification is only through Him. And that's and He was in every synagogue, every Sabbath, He was going in there to convince these folks of this. Some received it, and some didn't. And uh, in verse 20, and straightway He preached Messiah in the synagogues that he is the son of Elohim. That all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is the very Messiah. He was coming to his people to prove to them he is the Messiah. In verse chapter 13, we're going to close out chapter 13 here. Chapter 13 and verse, uh, this is Paul's first missionary journey. And then verse 14, and when they were departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. 
And after reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue said unto them, saying, You men, brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you that fear Elohim, give audience. The Elohim of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. So here, you know, he's going through the history and explaining. That's what we, we read when these guys are, are given a, a message here. They go into the history, they go into the scriptures, and they explain what's coming to pass, how these things are being fulfilled. I'm going to pick up in verse 27. I'm going to back it up to verse 23. Of this man's seed hath Elohim, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Yeshua. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all people of Israel. When it said that John was to prepare the way of the Master, the way he prepared the way was getting people to repent. And it was the repentant heart that received the Messiah. Um, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think you that I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you fears Elohim, to you is this word of salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they, Pilate, that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But Yahweh raised him from the dead. There he is, testifying to the resurrection. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made to the fathers, Yahweh hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Yeshua again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of Elohim, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom Elohim raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. He testified of the resurrection, and he said, Through this Yeshua, I am preaching the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which was spoken of in the prophets. Behold, you despisers, and wonder, and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of Elohim. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of Elohim. But when the multitude of Jews saw the multitude, excuse me, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Uh, so anyway, 
Paul continued for several years in the synagogues until finally uh, he ended up before uh, Herod, and he he told him that you know the reason I'm I'm up here on trial is because I believe that the promises that were given to our forefathers and all through the prophets, I'm just saying that it's come to pass. I'm saying that the Messiah is here and there's a resurrection through him. That's why I'm up here. And uh, there was a, a verse that I said I was going to mention. I might have skipped over it, but it says, there's no other name under heaven whereby we might be saved. And that's saying that there's no other man can do it. That's saying that, that Yeshua is the only one. And uh, I believe that, that, yes, we are supposed to respect his name and honor his name. But if somebody has a letter added to it or missing from it, that's not what gets them in or out of the kingdom. And I know that we need to be, we want to be zealous for what we believe in, but we don't want to hinder other people from coming in. Give them some grace. Let them grow. Let them know where you stand. Let them see the evidence from where you get it. And when you give them that evidence, give it with grace. Season with salt, according to the scriptures. Let every word be seasoned with, or let every word be with grace, seasoned with salt. I'm going to close out with this. Ladies and gentlemen, anybody that can, can hear my voice, I want you to, to close your eyes. And, you know, somebody might see this program in the future. I don't believe that Yahweh's spirit is bound through space or time. And um, I want to pray that we all have an experience today. And if anyone hasn't experienced this, we're going to pray for you right now that you will experience. And uh, we're going to pray that, that Yahweh's presence would indwell your life. We're all here with, with one accord, and we want to pray that the power of the Most High would come upon you and that you would receive a radical conversion of what we read right here. Father Yahweh, we thank you so much for all of your goodness. We thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you for all those things that we take for granted. Father, with one accord right now, we pray that your spirit would be poured out on every believer right now. We pray that you would stir up the gift of your spirit inside of everyone right now, Father. And that an amazing transformation and conversion would take place. And you would send us out as lights to your nations, Father. We receive the Great Commission. We want to teach what Yeshua taught. We want to teach repentance and the remission of sins and being baptized and receiving the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that your Spirit would be poured out in such a mighty way right now that it would change hearts and minds and give people a hunger and thirst to come after your word and to serve you and to be a living sacrifice. Father, we just thank you so much for the precious <coughs> gift of your son who died for our sins. In his name we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.